And good afternoon. Welcome to our final edition of the uh, 2023 Manure Mondays. We've had a great run here. My name is Andrew Barry, and I'll be your host again today in this final, uh, final wrap-up edition. If you joined us last week, then you were part of a great discussion we had around composting bedded pack barns. And uh, funny enough, that was the topic we addressed last year. We addressed it again this year, and we still didn't finish the conversation. So <clears throat> we already know that is on the agenda for next year. We'll have more discussion around that, but uh, a good session last week. This week, we're talking about biosecurity for disease control. And a couple of good speakers I'll introduce in a minute about that. But uh, first of all, just a reminder, as I said, this is the final week of Manure Mondays. However, all the sessions have been posted or will be posted on our um, YouTube channel, that's Field Crop News. So go take a look there. I know there's been quite a few views uh, of those sessions and they will remain posted there for your watching pleasure. As we get started today, reminder, you know the wrap, uh, please stay muted, but do not stay inactive. We want you to be in the chat, making comments, asking your questions. And here's the question I have to get you started this week. Being as it is our final week, would really like to know your ideas around future topics and future speakers. Somebody you've heard who has just done a great job on a topic or something that you think uh, we've missed or is really current, boy, we're thinking about next year already. So please uh, put those in the chat and then we have some ideas of what you're thinking and what we can do to meet your needs. So let's get into this today. Uh, and we will have a, a CEU credit uh, available posted at the end. So our two speakers today, first of all, uh, my colleague, Al Dam, who is our provincial poultry specialist. Al initially uh, did some work in uh, the private sector. He was working for Maple Leaf Poultry until we hired him in 2005. And without going into all kinds of detail, bottom line is if it has anything to do with feathers, then Al is the man on the job. So uh, we're glad to have Al here with us and uh, he'll be part of the conversation. But to start us off, we're going to have Susan Fitzgerald. And again, I, I expect many of you know Susan. Uh, from her, her company, Fitzgerald & Co., who's involved with many different farm organizations. And particularly if you're a certified crop advisor, then you certainly know Susan well from that industry. So why is she here today on the topic of biosecurity? Well, she's had a lot of involvement in that, whether it's designing content for workshops, whether it's teaching workshops, teaching at Lambton College, uh, you know, having a lot of work to do with, with the research around this whole area of farm biosecurity. And uh, so, so recently involved in, in even the disease response simulation and uh, of course, avian influenza outbreaks in Ontario, she was involved in that as well. So I'm gonna turn it right over to Susan to get it started here. And uh, Susan and Al, look forward to your chat. Let's go. Great, thanks very much, Andrew. And as he mentioned, Al and I are going to tag team this presentation. We're going to be talking about uh, biosecurity for disease prevention. So disease prevention, not just for livestock and poultry, but also disease and pest uh, prevention for, for plants and crops as well. So I'm going to start out the first half and talk about some uh, general biosecurity practices and sort of at a higher level. And then Al's going to come in for the second half and talk more specifically about manure and dealing with dead stock and also giving you some examples or, uh, for, um, from other diseases. Okay, so what is biosecurity? Well, really, uh, for, all, for the intents of, of this presentation, it's really the protection of animals or crops from any type of pest. And when I use the term pest, this is what I'm referring to. So whether in plants, we're talking about insects, weeds, or diseases, or diseases and parasites in uh, livestock and poultry. So when I use the term pest, it could be any of these. So here's the basic concept that we have. And this is going to be familiar to most of you. So the first thing you want to do is keep any of those pests out, out of your farming operation 
or out of your agricultural business. That's your first line of defense. But if something shows up uh, at your site, then you want to keep it in, right, to mitigate its spread and affecting uh, your sector or your commodity. And then thirdly, to shut it down or eradicate it as quickly as possibly as possible, if you can. But keeping in mind that some pests are really difficult to eradicate once they become established. And maybe in that situation, the best that producers can do is control it, unless they're going to invest a considerable financial investment in eliminating it from their herds or their flocks or their fields. So some examples of that might be Yoni's disease in, in a dairy herd, PERS in swine, coccidiosis in poultry, or if we're thinking on the crop side, um, potato rot nematode or, or club root. So those are examples of some of the ones that once they get established, um, more difficult to, to eliminate or eradicate. All right, so how are our diseases or pests spread? So for animals, the number one risk or the highest risk really is through animals that have the disease or are harbor, harboring the disease, but also it can be through other animals. And, and I'll talk about this in a few slides and Al has it in his slides as well. So animals other than your livestock and poultry. So whether it's your pets, or whether as we're seeing with avian influenza right now, it's in wild birds, so waterfowl primarily, but other birds as well. Or when I say vermin there, if you're thinking about mice or rats that can transmit pests on their feet and their fur, or even thinking of things like coyotes um, or deer that are, are moving about. So some, they can transmit if we're not thinking about something like, like even influenza, but even uh, leptospirosis or rabies or salmonella as well. So they can, they can be a very important vector that you don't want to overlook. And then as well, pests can be transmitted on clothes, shoeing, shoe, shoeing, clothing, shoes, or hair of visitors. Or, and visitors, I have a slide in a minute that lists everyone who I consider to be a visitor on farm and also employees when they're moving around your farm or between uh, farming operations um, or say between a farming operation and a sales barn or processing plant, uh, again, you're gonna have risk. Your high risk visitors would include uh, people like, if, if we're thinking about livestock and poultry, would be people like uh, livestock haulers, veterinarians, uh, maybe livestock owning neighbors if they have the same species as you, but anybody who's had that direct connection, they would be uh, at higher risk. And then as well, it can also be transmitted, your pest in, in feed, water, manure, uh, that's the inside of a, of a livestock trailer there being cleaned out. Al's gonna talk about dead stock and how pests can be transmitted in dead animals or aborted placentas contaminated farm equipment and vehicles. I'm gonna show you some slides. And also I know that we have farmers on the line, we have uh, service providers, so crop consultants and other individuals who might be going on farm. So you have to think about your vehicles as well, just not the farm equipment that's being used for field work. And then of course, diseases and pests can also be spread, can be airborne. So whether it's the actual spores of a, of a disease or whether it's some sort of pest that's maybe on, on crop residue or say on, on feathers that's, that's airborne. And so you have to think about all of these different vectors. Some may be higher risk than others. Now that was primarily skewed towards thinking about livestock and poultry, but when we think about plant pests, it's the same kind of idea. Only here we're talking about seeds, perhaps that have been infected with whatever that pest might be, whether it's a, um, a plant disease or an a, a insect or a weed seed. Again, it's the same sort of types of things, whether we're talking about livestock or we're talking about uh, plants. Again, birds, wildlife, and transmitted on uh, clothing, shoes, and, and visitors moving about the farm and from farm to farm. For crops as well, thinking about Irrigation water, depending on what type of, of crop you're looking at. Uh, soil, so soil borne pests, whether that's soil that could be moved because of erosion 
or whether it's soil that's uh, say mud on the tires of a vehicle or on your uh, equipment that's been working in the field. And again, also by airborne particles, same sort of deal. And Al's gonna talk about the disease cycle with some examples in his uh, presentation. And so there's just one example there. But when you're thinking about the disease cycle, so you know, think about, about human um, seasonal influenza or COVID, right? So you have someone who has uh, the influenza or the virus, uh, they cough on their hands or they have the virus on their hands, they touch the handle of a door, someone else comes along and touches that door handle and then maybe touches, touches their face or wipes the eyes. The same sort of idea or getting into an elevator. Uh, when you think about uh, the corresponding cycle for plants, what would it look like? Well, as I mentioned, you've got your contaminated seeds, your seedlings, or your crop inputs. You could have your crop residue or compost piles, could be the water in terms of irrigation water that I mentioned. And then you're bringing in equipment uh, to do field work that could have weed seeds, insects, or, or maybe soil borne pathogens, and then people and wildlife as well. So I'm not going to spend much time on that because, as I say, Al's going to go into that in a bit more detail. Now, who are visitors? Well, it's a whole range of people. So if you are a feed salesman, nutritionist, um, crop input delivery person, any sort of salesperson, really it's anyone that's coming on uh, to the farming operation should be considered a farm visitor. and any of those individuals should be following some sort of, of biosecurity practices and I'm gonna get into it a bit. Uh, who I don't have on there are truck drivers. So whether it's uh, hauling uh, animals, livestock, poultry, or plants, it, I also don't have on there 4-H groups, but think about that if you're hosting 4-H groups uh, that's coming onto your property or if you're a 4-H leader or if you have a child in 4-H. Customs, customers coming for pick your own operations as well should be considered in, in this. Okay, so what are some uh, biosecurity practices for visitors? So you can think about this if you have a farming operation or if you have some sort of agricultural operation that you should be putting in place for people coming onto your site, or if you are someone who's going from, from farm to farm, do you do these things? So certainly washing vehicles between farms is ideal, as it says there. And right now in the poultry sector, this should be considered essential if you're going from poultry farm to, to poultry farm. Um, or even if you're not going from a poultry farm to a poultry farm, what if you've been out um, conservation area, any place where there's, there's wild birds, uh, especially waterfowl right now. And Al, I'm sure is gonna touch on this uh, yeah, in a well, bit as well. Yeah. Even turkey hunting season has started, right? So we've got folks that are active hunters that are going to be traipsing through whatever, or even handling birds, and then potentially going back to a poultry farm. So even more critical. That's right. I forgot about the spring hunt. So, mm -hmm. you know, thinking about any any sort of interaction when we're thinking about avian influenza, but it's the same thing with, with other diseases. We're just really attuned to avian influenza because we have it and have been dealing with it for well, yeah, almost a year now, uh, since March 27th last year. Uh, it's been over a year in Canada, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, in Ontario, just about a year. Yeah. Uh, pay special attention to the vehicle's tires uh, as well, if you're going from, from farm to farm in the wheel wells. Uh, look at your footwear as well. So, you know, remove any obvious mud or organic matter for sure, scrub your boots, um, and then, use some sort of disinfectant. So make sure that you follow the manufacturer's instructions for the concentration and also the contact time uh, and paying special attention uh, to the treads. Also be sure to include any equipment that's used on farm. You might not think of some of these things like soil probes you would perhaps when we're thinking about from a, from a plant pest perspe uh, perspective for when you're going farm to farm. Um, but shovels, you know, scales, laptops, uh, anything that you've used on farm, and especially if you're if you're in barn uh, as well, to make sure that it's been cleaned and disinfected. All right, some other practices that you can keep in mind, and you know, sometimes I have people say, "Well, Susan, we can't do all of these things." Or some of these things that you're saying aren't practical. 
or not everybody does it. So, you know, why am I going to do it? Because someone else comes along and they do it. Well, fair enough, you know, uh, but I always say every step that you can take, any mitigation that you can, that you can put in place or practice or protocol that you can follow is going to reduce the risk of transmitting one of these pests. And if you are a service provider, or if you don't want to be the person who is responsible for bringing a pest to your, your customer's operation, or transmitting it from one farm to another, or even being suspected as being the vector for whatever pest it might be that has suddenly shown up. So whatever steps you can take and put in place is going to help reduce the risk, even if it can't be perfect. And granted, some of those things that I mentioned, you know, uh, windborne pests, um, you know, soil erosion or wildlife, some of those are, are hard to manage, you know, but you can put in place some practices or get, get your customers thinking about some practices they can put in place that can maybe lower the risk. So if you're going on farm, uh, avoid driving by barns that contain livestock and poultry, if possible, depends on why you're there and what you're going to be doing, and drive slowly to uh, minimize the dust, right? So you don't want to stir up any sort of, of pest that might be, be present. Also look for designated visitor parking and then park there. Um, and if there isn't though, make sure you avoid parking uh, close to the barns if there's another suitable place for you to park and you want to park near someplace ideally that's that's gravel or well drained and it's, you're not driving through crop residue or manure or mud etc and avoid parking by exhaust fans or air inlets and why we say that is uh, so if you have some sort of pest that's maybe on your vehicle you don't want it being sucked into the facility or conversely, anything that's inside that barn uh, coming out in the exhaust and getting onto or into your vehicle. So just some good practices there when you're going um, on farm. Don't enter any uh, barn or building on the property unless you need to do so, whatever, depending on whatever service you're there to deliver. If you need to go into uh, a facility to do that, then, then that's fine. Obviously you have permission, but make sure you have the permission of the farmer. Just don't go wandering around. We hear this sometimes from farmers that say they see a, a truck or a, you know, a, a vehicle driving around their farm and it's someone that's looking for them. They've shown up, maybe they have uh, an appointment or maybe they don't, they can't find the person that they're looking for. So they start driving around or wandering around the farming operation looking for them. Don't do that. Uh, if you're going on farm, um, or, or onto any sort of site, make sure you know where you're going to meet the person. And if they're not there, have a cell phone uh, number. How can you contact them to let them know that you're there? If there's a farm office, go in there or into the house. But don't just start going in and out of buildings, looking for someone or driving around. Because as we talked about, vehicles can transmit pests. If there's a visitor logbook, sign it to make sure they acknowledge that you've been there. But even if there is or even there isn't, make sure you keep your own record of where you have been. Now, Al and I are thinking about avian influenza because we've been directly involved in it for the last year. But if there is an outbreak of a federally reportable animal disease or a plant disease, or even if it's not federally reportable, it's just something that's a, a significant uh, economic impact or a production limiting uh, pest of some sort, you know, you're going to want to know, how did I potentially get it? Where did it come from? And where might it have gone? So before we knew we had it, maybe we had people going through here, we sold product, we sold animals, we shipped animals, and you want to keep, keep records of that. But CFIA, if CFA is involved for a federally reportable animal disease, they ask you to go back, I think it's 14 days, no, Al, 14, like two cycles. 14 to 28, based on what disease it is. Um, but yeah. Like, I can't remember what I had for breakfast yesterday, let alone <laughs> where I was 14 days ago. Well, and think, think of a farming operation or a, another type of agricultural business, you know, because we can think here of like feed mills, right? Or, or crop input supply, if something shows up there even. How many courier, you know, deliveries have even been made? Or if you think about a farm, people coming and going, you know, if, if you don't have records. And even if, if your records aren't perfect, it, it will help. Anything that you can do, any, any practice or protocol that you have in place 
will will help. Well, and, oh. and in the livestock industry, we're getting more into using electronic tracking of folks, right? There's software that's being developed or being tested or being used that uh, takes away the need for signing in a logbook, but it does track you where you go farm to farm. So if we have to do some of that trace back, as opposed to days of pouring through books and trying to connect the dots, it can be done instantaneously with big data. That's right. And and the that the particular software I think you're referring to, Alan, that, that I'm thinking of too, it doesn't track your movements outside of the farm. So let, let's let's use poultry because that's what we're familiar with. But so the, the poultry farms would uh, basically be uh, geofenced. And if Al and I had the app on our phones or if we had it on our GPS and our vehicles, it'll record us when we go onto the farm and off, but it doesn't track that we then went to Tim Hortons or, you know, Al went wherever Al goes. And uh, <laughs> it only tracks your movements uh, in, in uh, the poultry related businesses or whichever businesses are have any, uh, subscribed to that service. So that helps with some of the privacy issues too. Uh, leaving the site. Okay, so make sure you check your footwear before you get back into your uh, vehicle to make sure you're not tracking anything off. Even better yet, if, if you haven't wore disposable boot covers, um, you know, have a change of, of footwear, take your dirty boots off, put them in the trunk of your car, put your clean ones on. Really, ideally, how you would do it. You have to think about, you don't want your footwear, your clean footwear that you've arrived on touching the farm site and then going back into your vehicle. So you'd actually sit in your vehicle or sit somewhere, take your dirty boots off, throw them in a bag or a tote, put your clean ones on and then swing yourself back into your vehicle. That's especially gonna be if you're someplace where you know that there's a, a pest issue. And then clean and sanitize uh, your hands. This is after you've loaded your equipment, like your dirty equipment into your vehicle, clean and sanitize your hands uh, before getting back into your vehicle and starting it. Okay, so now talking about equipment risks, and I'm touching on a lot of stuff, but at a really high level uh, to make sure that I can get through this in, uh, in the time allotted. But if you think about equipment, can certainly has the potential to carry pest around the farm, moving it from field to field and between farms or different types of agricultural locations. And you'll see the list there, whether it's soil borne, diseases or pathogens, weed seeds or insects. And if you look at the back of that tractor there, you can just imagine that's been working in a, a muddy field. You've got them, you can see on the back of that, you've got some uh, plant residue that's there. And if it's not cleaned off and it goes into uh, another field, it can transmit anything that might potentially be in there. And not an uncommon site. All right, so this one, and if you are um, a crop input supplier or a crop advisor or a crop scout, pay attention to this because this photo shows the undercarriage of an ATV that was being used for crop scouting. So if I recall correctly, they were doing um, soil sampling in wheat fields and it was, it was rainy, it was wet when they were, were doing it. And so they came, they came back and the ATV was parked on the trailer for a few days before they could go out again. And the operator went out and they could, he could see this green sheen or tinge on the manif manifold. And when he got down and looked under, what they had done, I mean, it was, it was muddy, as I said, or wet. Um, there was mud there on the manifold and there was wheat seeds that had been in the mud and they had started to sprout. That was the green that he saw. And that for him, this was several years ago. So I think he's more in tune with this now as far as biosecurity, but that twig for him will say, okay, those are wheat seeds that are sprouting, but it could as just as easily have been weed seeds and we could be moving, um, you know, maybe even herbicide resistant weeds from, from a, this farm or farms where they had been working to another farm. And the same could be for any sort of soil borne pest or insect, they could have been, been transmitting it. Um, Montana State University did a research study to look at the role of vehicles and equipment in uh, transmitting uh, invasive weed species. So they were looking at invasive weed species, but they, that was the reason that they wanted to do it. But they, were, they looked at any uh, weed seeds that could be picked up. And what they found, 
that some seeds stayed attached to the vehicles even after 160 miles. So especially if they were caught up in the mud and then the mud dried on the vehicle, they could basically travel almost indefinitely until it rained again or unless the surface was wet and they fell off. So huge potential there for transmitting uh, pests, plant pests in this particular case, but it could be uh, as well uh, pests of concern to, to animals as well. And of course, the fall was a higher risk because again, you're going to probably have more weed seeds that are out there in the environment at the end of the growing season than you would have had in the spring. So it's not just farming equipment that has that, that risk, it's, it's others as well. Uh, if you know you have an area, if you have a particular farm or a particular area on a farm where there is a pest, known pest pressure, then if you can, complete work in what we're saying, the clean areas or the fields where you don't have that particular pest area first, and then do the, the problem area last to sort of minim minimize that risk and also minimize uh, the cleaning. And, and maybe in certain circumstances, you would have to do disinfection as well. Make sure if you can that you remove the soil and the plant material, especially if you're going from a problem area uh, before going into another field of production area. And in fact, in some of the uh, research that I've been reading, they're saying that that first level of cleaning makes the biggest difference. So, you know, knocking off all the visible chaff or soil uh, crop residue. So they're saying in the, in the one example, they're saying cleaning off the combine might be just as important or more important than cleaning out the inside of the combine. All right, so what are you gonna do if you have vehicles or equipment that shows up and they're not cleaned out? So have a plan for dealing with that. So, you know, you're probably not just gonna send them away if you've been waiting for them to come and do a pickup or a delivery, but how are you gonna handle that? So if you're thinking of a farming operation, maybe there's a particular area that you can designate as a clean out area. And that ideally though, as bullet point number two says there, you wanna remove all that soil and plant material offsite or someplace if you're gonna do it on site, that it can be contained. And this is, if, you, if farmers are providing, or if you, whatever your role is, if you're providing any sort of cropping service or manure service to others, you need to consider yourself to be a custom applicator or a custom service provider and have uh, biosecurity procedures uh, in place. Thinking about also if you're renting, leasing or purchasing uh, equipment or used equipment, what was it used for before? How has it been cleaned and disinfected? Um, and so, as I say, and, and then inspect it before it comes out. But also thinking about um, other types of vehicles or equipment that might be coming onto the farming property. So non-agricultural equipment. I talked about ATVs being used for agricultural purposes, but what about just recreational ATVs? What about um, hydro crews coming if you have a power corridor on your property or crews to service wind turbines or even as Al mentioned before, hunters that are coming onto your property. Where have they been before and have they been on other farming operations? Um, and could they be bringing any sort of pests that would be of concern to animals or to crops? Uh, thinking about uh, sludge and bio waste. So typically these products are tested for nutrients but not uh, for weed seeds. Now weed seeds won't be viable if the waste has been heat treated. However, not all waste has necessarily gone through a heat treatment. So ask about that and make sure you keep your records of the sources of your products and where um, each load or when, where and when it's been applied and where that source was. And then the third bullet point there, I think would just be common sense to ask uh, your neighbors if possible, not to spread manure or sewage bio solids near to your, uh, to your water sources. Same thing for manure. So that was sludge and biosolids. So for manure, know where the feed came from, if or feed source came from, if you're not using uh, the manure on farm that was produced on farm. And 
Uh, I, Chris, this was an example you gave to me a number of years ago. You were said you were telling me about weed pro weeds that can be problems, uh, can come from from manure. And the example you gave was velvet leaf. So it can be introduced, not just velvet leaf, but other sort of problem weeds uh, with manure if it's been in completely composted uh, manure. So if it hasn't been through the whole composting process, some of those weed seeds can still be viable. The other thing I recall that you told me is to look at manure storages and the areas around manure storages for weeds that are growing. If they're growing in the manure pile, if they're growing in the liquid storage, then they've proven to be viable in manure and they can be transmitted uh, out to the field. The other thing is that some fungal diseases, so fun some fungal spores uh, for affecting plants. So maybe the crop that was infected with whatever that fungus was, was fed to livestock. It wasn't, it wasn't um, harmful to livestock. So it was fed to them, but some of those fungal spores can still be viable in manure. So just to be aware of that, it can, they can pass through the animal digestive systems and still be viable. So depending on where that is then spread, that could cause a problem. <clears throat> and then thinking about, think, thinking back to my talk about the different vectors and I talked about insects. So flies uh, are a frequent carrier of disease and they can fly up to a, a kilometer and a half from farm to farm. <clears throat> so try and control that, that fly population, insect population on the farm. And talked about they're removing manure um, using any sort of uh, uh, insect control that you have. And down there, there was some research that came out that did prove that flies have the ability to spread PED. So of concern in the swine sector, it's a coronavirus that affects swine. Uh, it's a great concern if you have a farrowing operation, piglets, it'll, you'll have between 50 to 100% mortality. Older animals might get it or can get it but don't usually uh, die or you don't have that um, mortality. But flies have been shown to be able to transmit PED. Yeah, and avian influenza now. We found, on, we found flies or with avian influenza and darkling beetles. And that's just another uh, crop insect that's made its home inside a, a poultry barn. So yeah, it's, it's getting to be an all encompassing thing and flies are Filthy, right? They they thrive in filth. Yeah, and I didn't have that there in my visitor biosecurity list, but that just reminded me. So when you go on farm, keep your windows wound up in your vehicles because what happens? Well, we've all done it, right? You go, you drive away, and you've got flies inside the cab of your truck or your car or whatever. So when you're going on farm, leave the the windows rolled up. And, and we, we, OMAFRA, have to deal with nuisance complaints <laughs> revolving around flies, and we have had our share. And I'm really not looking forward to any other calls, but yeah, it's, it is one of the, the sins of agriculture that we could potentially have if, uh, if the fly population gets away from us, which can be a nuisance to neighbors, but also a disease risk. Mm -hmm. And manure equipment? Since this is Manure Mondays, I better speak specifically about manure equipment on at least a, one or two slides. So, of course, I mean, no surprise that pathogens can be transmitted either by the manure itself, but on the equipment, or as that first bullet point says there, contaminated clothing as well. So the individuals as well and their footwear or their clothing. Um, the one thing, don't forget to clean the inside of the vehicle as well because you could have tracked manure in, into the cab of the tractor, into the cab of the truck, whatever that vehicle is. So don't forget to clean it as well, as well as the exterior. And avoid sharing manure handling equipment with neighbors, because if you're sharing the equipment, that's going to increase your risk of sharing any sort of pest as well. And we've had examples of that um, with avian influenza, that that increases the risk for sure, it, with, with any sort of pest plant or uh, animal. And here's some other just good uh, best practices for manure, making sure the application equipment is, cl is clean when moving between farms. Also on roadways, so thinking about manure on roadways in barnyards, um, 
you know, driveways, we talk about that's a good biosecurity practice recommendation for farms is keeping the driveways and the vehicle um, pathways clean. So you don't want to have cross contamination. Al, I think you're gonna to touch a bit about that as well, about manure on roadways, uh, incorporating or injecting the manure into the soil as quickly as possible. And I already touched on the phone, the uh, final bullet point there is employees. So if you are custom applicating manure, then have employees change their clothes, disinfect and wash their boots between spreading sites. I think these other ones are pretty straightforward as well about having um, dedicated equipment and footwear for doing that um, manure transfer and application, keeping the records, talked about that. Um, but the last two bullet points I, I haven't mentioned before. And so thinking about if you're a custom applicator, avoid scheduling the same species of farms one after the other, right? Again, it's just another practice to help reduce that risk. So we're saying there's sort of do a rotation if you can, right? Swine and dairy, maybe swine, dairy, and poultry. Maybe you don't wanna do poultry and swine back to back because there's some potential there with the influenzas. But thinking about that, right? So if you were doing you know, a number of swine operations right after the other, higher risk. If you can't avoid it, then just make sure that you are more stringent in your biosecurity protocols and your cleaning and disinfection. Okay, I'm soon going to trans, uh, transition over to Al here, uh, but here's some things for you to think about, and we're talking about manure specifically. So Yoni's disease uh, can survive in manure and water for up to one year and on pasture and hay fields for six months. So if you have a, a, a herd that has Yoni's disease and it's in the manure and you're applying it, it can, it has the ability to survive on that pasture or hay field for up to six months. Avian influenza, look at the stats there. Avian influenza doesn't like hot, dry conditions. Okay, so, but it likes uh, mild, wet particularly. So you see there, it can survive in water for up to 207 days if we have 17 degrees Celsius. Uh, even at 28 days, it drops it quite a bit, but it can still survive for 102 days. If you think about in liquid bird feces, it can live for a month at four degrees. So think about in the spring of the year when you see Canada geese walking around, crapping, you know, and it's it's right around, you know, plus four or so. So that virus is viable or can survive for up to a month. Once we get up to 20 degrees Celsius, it'll only survive for seven days. And then looking at PED, this is, was a study uh, being done by Manitoba Pork, and they found that PED survived um, and considered to be infective because they had gone that next step. So not just survive, but it, it could be infective for at least nine months. And that was in, as I said there, earthen manure storages in Manitoba's climate. So nine months of manure uh, storage, and it's still considered viable. And, it's, and you can see there that PED is viable in quite a wide temperature range from minus 20 up to plus 10 for at least five months. So uh, difficult to deal with. And I have one final slide that I want to share with you. Uh, this one uh, pulled from Harold Clues. He's the uh, new incident commander of the Federal Command Center, had this information in a, in a presentation, which he had in turn had taken from a research proposal from Jean-Pierre Valencourt from Quebec. But I, if you're thinking about visitor biosecurity and bringing or transmitting disease. This was for avian influenza that they were, they were talking about. But look at here, the odds ratio. Five, your odds of getting or having avian influenza was 500 times lower for producers that had some of these biosecurity protocols in place for visitors to clean and sanitize their hands and boots. It was six times lower if they changed their boots between their barns. And then down there in the bo bottom two uh, boxes, it says it was seven times higher if their visitors had incomplete um, you know, hygiene measures for whatever they were doing coming on farm and 29 times higher if they were sharing farm equipment. 
So there's some stats for you on that. So that was a quick, quick overview of general generic biosecurity, whether you are a farmer yourself working on a farming operation or a service provider. So I'm going to stop sharing and turn it over to Al and he's gonna give you some more examples. Oh, you're muted, Al. That helps, okay. So uh, let's grip it and rip it. So yeah, I'm gonna talk about biosecurity uh, and some diseases in manure. So what do we need to think about? There's lots we need to think about. Uh, you know, diseased herds or flocks can have uh, diseases that can infect the manure. So are you spreading the disease? Are you bringing the disease to other farms? And then uh, are you bringing the disease from the environment to the farm? Because that can be another, and Susan talked about that a little bit, how do you treat infected manure? And I guess that's one of the, the main things that people are going to be interested in. And then I'm going to throw dead stock in there because, you know, what's the deal with dead stock? Well, it's a pretty big deal when it comes to the disease spread. And then the what ifs, what if I see uh, dead animals? And, and there is some protocols we want you to follow or just be aware of uh, about how you deal with, since you're going to be out in the field anyways, you, if you start coming across mass die-offs of wild birds or anything else. So what do I need to know about? Uh, the purple one here is uh, ASF. The blue one at the bottom, that's uh, influenza viruses. These, of course, are electron mic microscopy um, pictures. So that's not, you know, you won't be able to see that. But yeah, uh, all livestock and poultry can have health challenges. So we, and we, it runs the gamut, right? It's not just even influenza. It's not just foot and mouth disease, but it's mycobacterium, listeria, E. coli, salmonella, campylobacter, every, you know, lots of species carry that. With swine, of course, it's a PED, African swine fever, PERS, et cetera. And, you know, that list is not exhaustive by any sort. Uh, with poultry, of course, we're all talking about highly pathogenic even influenza, but we talk about virus and infectious laryngotracheitis and bronchitis. Those have been spread uh, with manure. And then uh, with cattle, of course, we got bovine viral diarrhea, we got scrapies, we got Q fever, fever with small ruminants, but of course, the big one is foot and mouth disease and many, many more. Oh, and let's not forget parasites like Giardia and Cryptosporidium that can be spread with manure also. So, you know, these are all things that we need to think about, um, whether your animals are sick or you're, you're the, the person who's doing some of the, the custom application. So how do we start, or, you know, can you bring diseases up? Of course you can. Uh, so poultry examples, because I'm the poultry specialist, we had a real virus that went through our broiler industry in 2017. Um, and there are cases where we've had, and, you know, of course we can't prove this definitively, but we've had cases where uh, a broiler operation had real virus. And of course it was late summer. So the wheat had come off and that, flock shipped out or in some cases we had to destroy the flock because the virus was that bad that manure then got put out into the um onto the onto the straw fields uh we had some broiler breeder flocks so some of the genetics for those broilers uh then became positive real virus in the end and it was the common denominator was manure was spread upwind from that operation uh we've seen ilt spread numerous times with broilers so infectious laryngotracheitis, it's a herpes virus that impacts the trachea of the birds. Um, many other examples with other species like PED in swine, we've, 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 even, got, um, we've even got information about that. Uh, if you're a farm accepting manure from off site, so Susan had spoken about this, you know, how do you prevent that? Is it the same species? So that's always a concern. If you're accepting, if you're a farm accepting manure from a custom applicator, is it the same species because there could be a disease risk there. Um, did those animals have a disease challenge? And what has been done to reduce the pathogens in the manure? So, uh, you know, one gram. So this, this back in the day, so some of you might be of the vintage that remembers these slides that we put on a, an overhead projector. This is where I stole this from. I think this slide is probably close to 40 or 50 years old. Uh, but one gram of manure with a, even influenza virus can equate to 1 million dead birds. That's quite easily. And yes, what are you doing? How, you know, are we running through this on the road? 
And, you know, if you're dropping manure on the road and a poultry farmer is running by or a feed truck's running by that picks this up, that then goes to their home farm or delivers feed to a poultry farm, that's potential spread. Now, my trucker friends all tell me, you know, I'll run down the highway, those tires heat up enough that they disinfect themselves. And absolutely, yes, they do with a big truck. But what about the wheel wells when that stuff gets thrown up into the wheel wells and then falls down at the, uh, at the farm that you're at next. So that's why we talk a lot about spraying and disinfecting uh, your vehicle before you go on farm or at least spraying the tires in the undercarriage. Talking about PED virus, we actually have uh, a fact sheet on our OMAFRA website about PED virus and considerations from newer application. You can look that up. Um, but yeah, talking about how we spread disease and, and this is another version of one of Susan's slides. So we can have direct transmission where the disease cycles within the flock um, but the disease can come from the environment, whether it's wild birds or animals or insects, but mostly us. And, you know, with modern poultry, we often call most of our diseases modern man disease because we're the ones who spread them. Um, but we can spread disease from poultry farms to wildlife. It's not always from wildlife to poultry. And we've actually seen that uh, with highly pathogenic avian influenza where uh, operations that were near... Um, Water, waterways that have had even influenza and, and maybe it went from the waterway into the barn, but then it went back out to the environment and there was tons of birds that were lost in that. And we've seen multiple cases of that throughout the world. So just be aware that some of these pathogens love moving around and they love moving around on us. Uh, and so, but we do have, if you have infected manure, if, if you're dealing with a farm that has had a disease challenge, what can be done? Well, this, this temperature probe, this is a four foot temperature probe um, that tells you a little bit all there, what I'm talking about already is with the type of manure, with solid manure, we can often compost it. So composting is an anaerobic process. It creates a lot of heat um for expensive periods of time like we can easily get above 55 degrees centigrade or 130 fahrenheit for over a week and you can destroy a lot of weed seed you can destroy a lot of pathogen but you have to turn it multiple times to reintroduce oxygen into that aerobic process there's limits as to how tall you can make this pile or windrow or whatever whatever but there's ways to do it that you can actually get that heat now some of us are really good at making compost piles and yes, we got to monitor the temperature. The temperature tells us we know when it gets up, uh, when it starts to drop, that means it's time to put more oxygen in the system by turning the pile. But sometimes we can get some pretty high temperatures and you know we, get, we can get over 70 degrees centigrade in there and that gets close to the point where things might start to spontaneously combust. So that's another concern to have uh, if you're composting to just keep an eye on that pile. Liquid manure, whole other ball game. It's generally an anaerobic environment. Um, you can agitate to try and introduce oxygen to try and help break things down. Temperature is gonna be a big thing. You're not gonna heat up a manure tank, but you're gonna have to wait until the warmer weather comes and try and agitate it and oxygenate it that way. Um, Susan already mentioned, use, use injection in the field to try and get that manure down so that it's not gonna be potentially spreading uh, pathogen. But in the grand scheme of things, it depends on the disease. Uh, we can have things like African swine fever, which is a real challenge to deal with uh, in the environment. It's, it's a very tough virus. And how do we deal with that? Well, at that point, I'm going to say contact your veterinarian and the relevant authorities to, to work through that. Each disease is different. Even influenza is a relatively easy disease to deal with once it's out of the host. Uh, it doesn't like, as Susan mentioned, doesn't like dry, doesn't like heat. We are lucky enough to have that. But right now, uh, it's not going to be warm out here until mid-June uh, in Ontario. So dead stock, what's the deal with dead stock? Uh, yes, are you spreading de dead stock compost? And the question becomes, is it really composted? So what do I mean by that? Truly composted means it's been through an anaerobic process. It's been turned a number of times. We got no discernible parts coming through. And yes, I get those calls when someone's composting their chickens and the neighbor's dog brings back whole birds when they spread it on the field. That's not composting. We want to cook the pathogens out of that. Uh, no chunks of animals being flung out the back of your spreader. 
The other issue that sometimes happens with dead stock compost is it needs to cure. And by that, you need to let it sit uh, and cure in the pile for a number of months. We've had farmers that have actually put uh, dead stock compost that's a little bit too green out in the field and it literally pulls the nitrogen from the soil as it continues to try and, and uh, compost through the anaerobic process. So the carbon in the shavings or the straw or whatever is pulling the nitrogen out of the soil because that's what it does to break down. Now, the one thing about properly managed dead stock compost is it actually has less pathogen risk than raw manure. So done properly, you really don't have that much pathogen risk. There is limits as to where you can spread it and what you can do with it. And that depends on a lot of things, including federal, provincial and municipal regulations. So in Ontario, we have the Nutrient Management Act that uh, that deals with how we deal with dead stock. And you need to prove, you need to use a method that that works for your needs and what is practical. So, you know, we're lucky enough in this province to have some rendering capacity. Uh, we can compost, we can bury. And honestly, burial is probably the least preferred option for dealing with compost, or sorry, dealing with dead stock, because that is, there's a lot of limitations. And once you bury that, that those carcasses are there forever in that in that soil. You're entombing them. Uh, incineration technically is an option in Ontario, but you need pretty much a medical waste incinerator to incinerate properly. We don't want smokers out there and disposal vessels, which are more or less dead pits that I know we use in the sheep industry. And, and in some cases, we use in the poultry side too. Um, this throwing a bird on the manure pile is not composting. Uh, this with the dog or whatever, some people call this natural disappearance. Once again, that's even worse. Um, but these are this is not acceptable dead stock management. When it comes to composting, there's a number of different things we can do. We can do windrow composting of this, and these are 40 pound toms that are being put in, in a compost pile. These compost piles, you don't want any more than six feet tall because then they won't chimney properly to get the oxygen in through the bottom and, and, it, and it vents out the top. Uh, it has to be turned. These piles are about two weeks worth of deads in this situation here. And then once you build this, this pile out for two weeks, then you start the next pile and you just put a one foot base down, you throw the birds down and just continue to cover it. When you build this pile out to the two week mark, then you just take the loader tractor and you flip that pile. You, you keep flipping it to the right, to the right, to the right. And that's how you reintroduce oxygen to it. That's how you keep the compost process going. Uh, from our facts, from our dead stock webpage uh, on the Umafra site, we actually have pictures of three bin composters. There's one, two, three, then there's four, five, six, and seven, eight, nine. Once again, these, compo these three bin composters can be built so that you put two weeks worth of deads in, let it sit for two weeks, then you move it and you just keep moving amongst the bins. Here's a bigger version of that with uh, bulkheads that we can use uh, to, to, to manage that manure or manage the dead stock. So lots of things we can do to properly compost deads where we don't have juices coming out, creating environmental hazards or having scavengers coming, which is another issue. And, you know, will you ever haul dead stock compost? Well, yeah, we do. We actually wrote a, a fact sheet on windrow composting of poultry carcasses where, you know, we, we have in the, in the poultry industry, sometimes we have flocks that are uh, end of lay on the layer side that uh, don't have a processing home. So we are euthanizing them on farm and in some cases composting them on farm so we can have these windrows. And this is a, this is a picture of a brown bear compost turner that can take a pile and move it sideways. It's, it's a mix between a snowblower and a rototiller and uh, it'll, it'll really do a, a, quite a number. And maybe so, uh, we should mention here because if, if anyone's not familiar um, with depopulating AI positive birds in Ontario, we tend to depopulate them, gas them in barn and compost them in barn, but generally. Yeah, to keep to keep the disease contained, and uh, yeah, and I'll get into that in a couple of slides. Um, so yeah, who does it? Who does it infect? When it comes to highly pathogenic avian influenza, it's commercial chickens and turkeys, of course. It's infected commercial ducks, game birds. Now the wild bird side is a is another one. And Terry had mentioned that in the chat I saw. Um, so migratory wild birds like ducks, geese, swans, colonial nesters like gulls or cormorants. Um, we've seen it in all of these but we've also seen it in scavengers. So 
raptors like hawks, eagles, owls, and turkey vultures. And turkey vultures have died from this. Nothing kills a turkey vulture other than getting hit by a car, I thought. Um, but they will die from high path AI. Uh, and corvids like crows and ravens have died from this also. So we're seeing a lot of those scavenger species are, are being caught up in this. But we're also seeing scavenger mammals, skunk skunks, foxes, coyotes, wolves, raccoons, mink, bear, uh, otters, and even seals. So anything that feeds on some of these dead or dying wild bird carcasses we've found, which then turns us into another concern about um, if you're not managing your dead stock properly and you're inviting some of these scavengers onto your farm, you actually could be bringing this disease to your farm and, and then getting into a situation where you don't want to be. So what are the clinical signs? I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but essentially it is, we see birds dying in three to five days on the turkey side and a little bit longer on the chicken side. But when they die, they die. And we're seeing practically 100% mortality uh, in, those, in those species. Uh, and other species, it's very similar. Um, but yeah, what's the process when a sick bird calls in? Uh, if a farmer suspects that they got, and this will go for actually any foreign animal disease, there's testing that happens. You call CFA, they'll come out and test. There's a confirmation that comes. So the, that sample will be sent to the animal health lab at Guelph and then confirmed in, in Winnipeg. Uh, if it's a foreign animal, foreign animal disease or portable disease, there could be export implications to that. There's the quarantine and trace back that we spoke about earlier and zoning happens so there's a 3 and 10k zone at least for avian influenza that's put in the in the place um and then when it comes to destruction so destruction is the term we use for killing these animals that are infected uh we have options but it's usually carbon dioxide uh gas for whole barn gassing on the poultry side uh for other species that will depend on the species the reason i put paid for by cfa is that cfa covers that cost Disposal, and this is what Susan was talking about, is often on-farm composting. We don't want to spread that infected material. And those infected, mat infected material includes deads, manure, feed, potentially eggs, and that all has to get composted on site, hopefully in barn. And that, of course, is paid by CFA. And then when it comes to primary disinfection, that's when CFI stops paying, uh, at least on the feather side, and that's when you as a farmer have to start poning up some, some cash. And then, of course, uh, secondary disinfection isn't that big a deal because you've already cleaned up everything. Uh, and then Ontario, we have, or sorry, in, in, with even influenza, after you've hit that final disinfection, then there's a 28-day surveillance period before that infected premise, that's what IP stands for, is revoked. So here's an example of a zoning map uh, from before Christmas where we had a, a few operations down the Strathor area. So you can see the three and then the the uh, 10K zone, we don't make it a circle because then you can figure out exactly where the farm is. So it's usually based on county roads or in some cases, some natural barriers. Um, but when it comes to wild bird concerns, yeah, I'm getting pictures sent to me every day now, last fall and, and actually in the last couple of weeks of snow geese flying around. And in some cases where we have snow geese around lagoons, we find dead snow geese, so they're neurological and they're all testing positive for influenza. So last few slides, we talk about migration. It's happening right now. We have a site, uh, ontario.ca slash haven influenza, where you can get information on that. Um, and biosecurity measures this spring. Once again, confirm uh, your sickness with a veterinarian, self-quarantine, exclude wild birds, pick up spilled feed, because that attracts everything, including rodents. I mean, especially I'm concerned about rats because rats live outside the barn. Mice live in the barn, rats live outside the barn, they go back and forth and back and forth. If you got a hole the size of a quarter, a rat can fit through. A hole the size of a dime, a mouse can fit through. Uh, potentially keep birds inside after, until after spring migration, which might be mid-June. Dead stock management is going to be huge. Uh, proper biosecurity, uh, standard operating procedures and use of personal protective equipment is going to be critical. And we will do whatever outreach we need to do and there will be industry updates. So, and if you see wild birds, contact Canadian Wildlife Health Cooperative. And that is the last thing I want to talk about is, yes, if you have lots of wild birds on your property, is that a risk? Absolutely. If you find dead birds on your farm, contact the CWHC. That's their phone number in Ontario. That's their national website. 
Uh, we said a cluster of three small birds or one large one. The large bird includes a duck. So if you find a dead duck on your property, send it in. We will, or they will get tested um, and we will try and do the best we can to, this is part of our surveillance, right? And like I said, we, we have seen it in mammals. Fortunately, at this point, it's been a dead end disease in mammals. It hasn't been spreading mammal to mammal, uh, we hope. So that's where we are. And with that, there's my contact information. If anyone needs to get a hold of me or wants to yell at me about something. And at that, I'm going to turn it back to Andrew. Very good. Thanks, Al. Thanks, Susan. Now, we're, we're going to continue with questions uh, for a minute here, but I just want to uh, put this QR code up. We are at the, uh, at the hour. And so um, share that. So, so if you uh, need that for a certified crop advisor credit, you can grab that right now. And while you're doing that, uh, just let you know that you will receive a follow-up email and we'll have an evaluation just to get your feedback. Some of you have mentioned some topics and speakers you can think of, uh, either mention them now or there will be a chance on that evaluation to do that. And uh, I also do wanna thank uh, Colin Elgy. Colin has been uh, hosting these for us. Uh, he's our, our colleague out of Ridgetown, the soil fertility specialist. And so Colin, thank you very much. And thank you to Christine Brown as well. And uh, so I will stop that sharing there. We'll come back and we're gonna have uh, Q and A now or any wrap up comments you wanna have and we'll, we'll carry on here because there's, there's uh, a number of questions. Um, maybe I'll start just uh, some that have come in with the chat directly. Al, you kind of touched on this quickly at the end there, but uh, Terry was asking about the uh, impact of migratory fowl. Maybe you can yeah. elaborate on that. Yeah, so you remember the one slide that showed the various migratory pathways were, were on the Mississippi flight path, but really uh, this is a North American disease. It's on the wing. Uh, specifically, I'm concerned about mallards because they seem to be, this This disease is host adapted to mallards. So they are the, the species that seems to be able to spread the disease. They don't die from it. And when it jumps into other species like Canada geese, like tundra swans, like whatever, that's when we start seeing some of that mortality. Uh, so, you know, that's my concern. We want tight biosecurity. If, you know, I, I'm concerned about folks that have birds or, you know, poultry outside during the summer months or spring or fall, uh, but especially during the peak migratory times, which is spring migration is from now to mid June. Fall migration starts mid August, goes to December ish. So we really don't have that much. And, and in fact, Fall migration is a bit of a misnomer because um, how many birds didn't migrate this past winter? The, the lakes didn't freeze up. We had piles of birds and, and our last six infected premises in December, November, late November, beginning December were all commercial, mostly after migration had quote unquote finished, but the environment now has influenza in it. And the, as Susan said, this virus loves the cool weather. So, we actually have virus out there right now. Absolutely we do. And, and in fact, uh, Susan pushed out something this morning <laughs> that we have a new infected premise down by uh, in Chatham Kent. So it's a small flock, but it's still, you know, that just goes to show that the virus is out there. Yeah, not what we want to hear, but uh, certainly true. Susan, you were going to comment on that? Well, I was just going to, um ask Al, because I had said to Al, how long are we going to have to live with this disease with avian influenza? Like normally you would expect the disease to go through a population, right? And kind of burn itself out. And Al, what did you tell me? Or someone told me three years? Three to five years, we expect to see this disease in the wild bird population before it burns itself. But when I say burn itself out, it's going to keep changing itself. And it's just, you know, we can use the COVID example, right? as we develop some immunity, hopefully, and, and the virus changes, it hopefully gets less infectious. But, you know, if it's in that wild bird population, uh, birds do survive, but in the domestic bird population, we, we are, we're not that lucky. So yeah, we could be dealing with this for, for a few more years. So here's an interesting question here. And, uh, See, see who can, can answer this or do your best anyway, but this is a farmer who has a, a liquid dairy tank and um, is using microbial 
treatments in the manure right now, but wondering, uh, just because that's probably his mindset, is, is there any possibility of some treatment in the manure tank when you have these viruses and other things present? So there's a couple ways to look at this. Some of it is, is uh, population exclusion, right? And that's some of the probiotics and stuff. That we, and we, we're using that for gut remediation in, in animals now that can be done in the, uh, in the tank. The other component of it is, can you treat it with a chemical or an acid? And that becomes much more problematic with a big liquid manure tank. And that, that has become some of the, the challenges that we've, we've seen with various diseases, whether it's ASF or something else, that's really hard to deal with. How do you deal with hundreds of thousands of gallons of material? And I don't know. <laughs> I don't yeah. know. I just don't know. That's, no. uh, that's a challenging one. We, we talked about uh, acidification in the tank, but from a managing greenhouse gases perspective, which is totally different. But yeah, curious if there might be a side benefit. And as you say, maybe we don't know, but that, that's something to be added to the, the research list, I guess, for the, for the future. Well, if, if you remember your high school chemistry, right? To make something acidic, it's, it's based on the buffering capacity. So you may need to add thousands of gallons of acid or base. And then when you're done, now what do you do with it? You then have to neutralize it, which then means adding thousands of the opposite gallons back. Yeah, It's hard to do if, if you got a full tank. Yeah, it is. And I don't know if I do remember my high school chemistry. That was a different millennia. So we'll, yeah, that's we'll true. Keep yeah. Keep that at that. Um, Here's, here's another question. Um, do you think that the development and administration of a vaccine for HPAI would be effective, economically feasible potential? Uh, we may have to. We may not have a choice, I think, on this one. Um, and there is, so the, the challenge with vaccination is that it impacts our trade. For the foreign animal disease, uh, if we vaccinate for a disease, when we send animals uh, overseas or wherever, whatever receiving country receives them, if it depends on our international agreements, uh, they may find the antibodies for that disease through the vaccine or through the disease, and they just won't let the product in. Um, but enough of the war, like this, this disease has been spreading. This H5N1 Eurasian strain has spread from Europe, Asia, Europe to pretty much every continent other than South Africa at this, or sorry, Antarctica at this point. Um, like it's, it's spread to North America last year. It's now in South America. Uh, we are seeing some pretty high mortality events with wild birds and domestic poultry. So we may not have a choice other than to try and vaccinate at some point, but that's, uh, that's for someone with a much higher paycheck than me <laughs> to decide that. Yeah, fair, fair enough. Um, question here in terms of composting, you talked about composting. Um, so how long does a material need to be composted before you safely can apply it to fields or to neighboring fields? Uh, well, if proper composting cycle and, and general, um, generally, we say that once it's been through three heat cycles, everything that's been on the outside of the pile has gotten a chance to be to the inside of the pile, right? Um, and in the grand scheme of things, that cycle can be as short as six to eight weeks, depending if you can you know, turn the pile every couple of weeks. But then, like I said, you, you're going to want to let it cure for a few months after the fact. Uh, so that from a pathogen standpoint, there's not going to be much disease in there after those first two or three heating cycles. It'll be now then the, the nutrient availability will be the issue if it's not cured. Uh, in some cases, I, I got some folks that use, like we'll bring in shavings for dead stock compost and they actually can reuse it because there's so much nitrogen in there that they'll reuse that uh, finished, quote unquote, finished compost as starter for the next batch of, of mortalities that they deal with. And they can reuse that product three and four times before you, you do it. You just start concentrating the phosphorus, you blow the nitrogen off, but yeah. You start concentrating the phosphorus. Yeah. 
So Susan, you talked a lot about um, the components of biosecurity and a biosecurity plan. And uh, it's always that getting from theory to action. Where does somebody start? What, what's the first thing to do? And, and where does somebody go to get uh, the information and the supplies that they practically would need in their biosecurity plan? I think you just do some really, really simple steps, really that are low cost, no cost. You know, simple things that changing your boots, cleaning your boots, wearing disposable boot covers, uh, washing your hands, uh, have a different set of boots that you're using on farm than if you're going off farm. You know, there's some really simple things you can do. Uh, putting in place designated visitor parking, signing it, uh, making sure it's, a, it's an area, maybe it's graveled, it's well drained. So there's some really simple things that you can do that don't cost a lot of money and aren't very um, complicated, but can make a big difference. There's a number of websites out there. Um, the Ontario Livestock and Poultry Council has both livestock biosecurity and plant biosecurity uh, resources out there. The website's ontlpc.ca. I can put that in chat. That's one place to go. Uh, OMAFRA on their website has biosecurity resources as well that's available. And so they say just any little step that you can you can put in place can make a big difference. Awesome. I had a call last week and it's not unusual to get these. It was from a municipality in Ontario who is looking to um, reduce red tape or reduce restrictions on backyard flocks, backyard housing of livestock on very small agricultural lots. These could be two acres, which maybe have been restricted in the past and they're looking to open it up because people love to have a few chickens, some cows, a couple of horses in the backyard. So I, I'm just curious, does that raise any alarm bells uh, with, with you folks? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Mary, you, you and I are both bureaucrats. We're not allowed to have an opinion. You know that, right? <laughs> but I'm asking the question. Yeah, but when I talk to a municipality, yes, I will talk about the pros, right? The local food, there's some mental health components to having that. Um, you get to teach Johnny where his food comes from, little Johnny where his food comes from. But then I do list out all the cons, and they can be quite a significant list from everything from disease scenarios, food safety, uh, urban vermin, you know, the neighbor issues. And in some cases, even things like, are you on a, a WAPA? Are you on a wellhead protection area? You can't even have a dog kennel if you're in a WAPA, but you know, you think, and we're talking about a pound of high test a week out of one hand. That's the manure she kicks out. And how do you deal with that manure? Because people say, oh, I'll just put it in my garden. Well, putting raw manure in a garden is a great way to pick up whatever in whatever, right? So, you know, if it's used for your flower bed, that's one thing. If it's used for your vegetable garden, that's something I don't want either. So yeah, we just list all of these things out and some, some municipalities decide this is not a good thing based on the fact that they have neighbors that are quota holders and some just think, yeah, you should do this. And then some municipalities go, oh, we have a bear problem in town. Let's not add to it. <laughs> so it's it's a very it's a very geographically specific issue. Well, and, and I'm not sure if you mentioned right there at the beginning, Al, because I got I got frozen out. But um, you know, a lot of smallholders don't understand the implications, right? The pest implications or the disease implications, and so maybe they don't understand, but but also um, they don't have the resources to put in place some of those practices, right? And we saw with, with avian influenza this fall, the initial wave this fall were small flocks that were outside, housed outside, and were co-mingling with, with waterfowl, with, with migrating waterfowl. And then they, be, they became positive for avian influenza and that established a zone and had a lot of other uh, implications. So yeah, yeah there are, there are some and see, and as a small poultry holder, you get to experience the same thing that a commercial poultry holder does when they have this foreign animal disease on your property. CFI will come in, quarantine your operation, order the birds destroyed, and then you get to go through that cleaning and disinfection process, which in some cases meant uh, a bulldozer was brought in, things were leveled, and 
burnt to ash because that's the only way they could disinfect that property. So yeah, that is that has become some of the discussion that's happened with industry and government is how do we deal with some of our small flock non quota poultry holders. And, and not just not just poultry either, right? We have we've people who have you know a few uh, pigs or sheep or goats, other mm -hmm. you know livestock as well. And I know in the in the swine side, trying to get those folks connected with veterinarians. Uh, so that they can at least get some um, advice, some animal health, some uh, animal welfare advice from veterinarians and just be aware of the risks and uh, have someone to call on if something um, unusual is cropping up in their animals. But, but that's a challenge too, right? Because sometimes your uh, large animal veterinarians really don't want to be bothered with a single pig or, you know, a pet sheep, that kind of thing. So making sure that they have... Uh, veterinary health and veterinary expertise at hand is another concern. Fantastic. Susan, Al, thank you very much. Uh, this work is important. <laughs> it's important, not just within the agricultural uh, community. This is important across the board to all of us. So thank you very much. Appreciate the work you do. Thanks for giving your time today. Well done. And, um, and folks, uh, that's it for 2023. Thank you very much for attending Manure Mondays. And we will look forward to seeing you again next year as we address some new topics and new speakers. And so again, thank you very much. Take care, have a great day. Take care everyone. Thank you.